Welcome back to another live session. Thank you so much for being here. Today, we're going to talk about weight regain on Hollywood's weight loss magical drug called semiglutide or ozepemic. This is a natural, or actually it's a pharmaceutical GLP-1 agonist. And we're going to talk more about glucagon-like peptide 1 and the various gut-related hormones known as incretins. These are involved in suppression of appetite, improvement in insulin sensitivity, and even cessation of uh, you know cravings for food and things like that. And this has been really pumped up by the media. Uh, and word has it that Pfizer is working on their own oral GLP-1 agonist. And so what I want to do today is just talk a little bit more uh, about the difference between short-term solutions and long-term solutions. You know, we live in this society or society where folks are really focused on quick fixes, immediate gratification. We need uh, to lose all that weight before the wedding. And we don't really care what happens after the fact. And we've seen this over the years with bariatric surgery, where people undergo uh, surgical resection of various anatomical futures of their gastrointestinal tract, and they go on to regain the weight that they lost after the procedure. Now, we are seeing similar situations with injectable GLP-1 receptor agonists such as ozepemic or semiglutide. And so I thought it was helpful to uh, talk about this because, you know, a lot of folks are really, really excited about this particular drug. And I want to share with you uh, what happens long term when people take an injectable GLP-1 receptor agonist such as semiglutide. And so the, the title of the paper that we're going to talk about uh, today is titled Weight Regain and Cardiometabolic Effects After Withdrawal of Semiglutide, the Step 1 Trial Extension. Now, this particular study followed 1,961 adults with the BMI, they were, they were overweight of over 30. And these individuals did 68 weeks of one week sub, subcutaneous injection of semiglutide, 2.4 milligrams. Um, and then they followed them for another 60 some odd weeks after the fact. Now, here's what they found. One year after withdrawal of once weekly subcutaneous semiglutide at 2.5 milligrams injectable, um, participants regained two-thirds of their prior weight loss with similar changes in cardiometabolic variables. So what was interesting about this particular study is they found there were cardiometabolic improvements, such as changes in blood pressure, such as changes in atherogenic lipid profiles, but people gained 66% of the weight that they lost back. And so that's what I want to focus in on today. And I want to welcome all our live viewers for being here. Thank you for being here live. Um, we are going to continue to talk about this. So it's very important to recommend to people solutions that are more sustainable because what happens when we inject exogenous hormones is we get this phenomenon known as receptor downregulation. So the receptors become oversensitized, uh, you know, overstimulated, I should say, to these exogenous hormone-like compounds, and then the receptors become desensitized. And that leads to challenges when it comes to when people come off the medications. We've seen this with testosterone. We've seen this with other hormones. Now, why would we be surprised that when we're, you know, impacting this GLP-1 receptor, that when you remove the drug, the effects go away? So I'm all about people getting you know, uh, improvements in their body composition and metabolic health. But it is important to recognize that when people uh, take something like this semiglutide, ozepemic, and some of the oral agents, that there could be weight regain. So the, the challenge with staying on a GLP-1 receptor agonist forever is there are links with potentially pancreatic cancer and overstimulation of the pancreas and all that. So it's important to recognize sustainable solutions and that's what we're going to focus on today, my friends. So as always, I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. If you have any comments, let me know in the chat. And we are going to continue on here and talk a little bit more about this. Now, I'm, of course, not the only one talking about the uh, questioning the, the the fervor of semiglutide and ozepemic. This was a, a an article that was just published a few days ago, actually, uh, in the British Medical Journal titled, Semiglutide, Should the Media Slim Down Its Enthusiasm? And I think they, they talk a lot about how Hollywood's favorite skinny jab um, is, is marketed as a magic weight loss uh, solution and so forth. And even The Economist did a future story, something to the effect of eat, inject, repeat, or something was the title. I didn't actually read uh, that particular article in the, in the Economist. But 
Again, it's important to recognize that when we're focusing on weight loss, uh, we need to focus on sustainable solutions. So you might be wondering, well, you know, Mike, what are these sustainable solutions? What I'll do is I'll, I'll just put this article uh, here for some of you and uh, I'll minimize this. So it's just there. And essentially, if you're just coming here live, what this uh, study found after tracking people for uh, almost a, over a year after they stopped the semi-glutide is they regained about 66% of the weight loss. So what is a sustainable solution? Well, let's talk about daily feeding window compression. We know that people that eat close to bedtime tend to struggle maintaining healthy body composition. So if you can give yourself about three to four hours of zero calories before bedtime, before your desired bedtime, and try to be consistent with that bedtime, that's going to help you in the long run when it comes to maintaining healthy body composition. We know regular physical activity, pairing resistance training with cardio. And so doing some sort of interval training on top of resistance training is going to be helpful. So I encourage all my clients to lift weights at least three days per week, preferably four. That's where you start to notice some of the benefits. And Various studies have found that exercise stimulates these various receptors and gut hormones that become desensitized when people gain weight. So exercise is a, a wonderful natural strategy that functions similarly to these Hollywood magic weight loss drugs, but it is actually sustainable. And so making a habit out of exercise can be very helpful. Um, also, we know that people uh, that uh, ex eat excessive calories obviously gain weight. And so, uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of counting calories, but over consuming energy. And so I, I, th I see a lot of people in the low carb ketogenic diet community, what they do is they uh, focus on their macros and trying to stay in ketosis by uh, consuming a lot of fat. Uh, I think it's important to prioritize protein and then layer in the carbohydrates and the fat based upon exercise demand and physical activity demands. So that's another um, huge thing that can be very, very helpful. Um, what are some other solutions? Well, we know that walking, particularly after meals, uh, can be very helpful at actually stimulating these gut hormones. So just by going for a little walk after you eat a major meal, after a large breakfast or after a large lunch or after dinner can be very, very helpful. Uh, other studies have actually shown improvements in metabolic health with natural compounds like berberine hydrochloride. This has been used in Chinese medicine for the better part of 3,000 years. It has a, a large safety profile. A lot of people do quite well with this. And it turns out that berberine hydrochloride might function by way of the gut and the gut microbiome. So it is important to recognize that this can actually have a beneficial effect on body composition. So those are some solutions uh, people should consider. Another thing that folks might want to consider is looking at their omega-3 index. We know that people that have low levels of omega-3 fats uh, tend to uh, be consuming diets rich in, in uh, the vegetable oils that are rich in linoleic acid or omega-6s, and that has been shown to increase levels of inflammation in the body, peroxidation, and, and potentially malandialdehyde and oxidized LDL. So one thing you might want to consider is adding in more omega-3 fats. And a few different studies have found that when people are doing a weight loss intervention, when they supplement with omega-3 fats, they tend to lose more body fat and spare the loss of lean muscle. Um, so that's really important. Um, so let me just get to some questions here. Uh, we have Athena says, I think anytime you take a quick fix and don't fix the bad habits, uh, it's gonna come right back to you. And so we do see that. Again, quick fixes, um, you know, easy, easy, quick fixes don't really solve the problem. So we have BR or, uh, says, every time I lose 10 pounds, I go into thinking it's always the final 10 pounds, but there's another 10 pounds. Yeah, so sometimes the, uh, the what can help is being more sustainable. Slow and steady is actually better than quick fixes because um, the body undergoes this process known as adaptive thermogenesis. So if we lose weight really quickly and, and really try to uh, ramp uh, calories down and exercise up, the body tends to guard homeostasis and you can have a slowdown in your resting metabolic rate and thyroid hormone output and everything like that. Um, so life is a marathon, my friends, not a sprint. So that's something to consider. Janet says, um, is this a study run by the pharmaceutical company? My understanding is the folks that are doing the drug trials were not told to change their diet and exercise. Um, yeah, really interesting um, aspect here. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Janet, when uh, people are doing these 
uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies are running these these drug trials. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are actually encouraging people to not change any of their parameters to actually test for the effect of the drug in and of itself. So that's, as I understand it, I haven't read step one, step two, and all these, but I'm just looking at the long term. Um, long-term effects here. So uh, Janet is disappointed that I'm not talking about this, but um, it is important to recognize that when a drug company is trying to test the effect of just the drug alone, it makes sense to minimize the number of variables. And so to the best of my knowledge, these particular studies have not um, also added in diet and lifestyle change. But of course, we know that those are going to enhance the effectiveness of the drugs. Um, but they did have a placebo group in this particular study as well. So, yeah, I think it's it's quite interesting um, that so many people are ranting and raving about these injectable and oral GLP-1 agonists, but there's so many different natural compounds that I mentioned, from berberine to exercise to compressing your feeding window to eating in a circadian rhythm, uh, aligned uh, environment, not e eating a bunch of calories right before bedtime. All of these things can actually improve metabolic health and the... Uh, stimulation of the gut hormones that can help control appetite and satiety. In fact, one study recently found that pairing resistance training with cardio actually led to many favorable impacts on appetite and satiety. So that's important to uh, recognize. So yeah, um, I just wanted to cover this. I don't, I don't think not too many people are are really uh, talking uh, about the long term effects. You know, everyone's so excited about short term, but what's the point of of taking a drug that might compromise uh, pancreatic function, increase your risk of pancreatic cancer, um, and then causes you to regain sixty six percent of the weight that you lost? And so, I think that's really not being talked about. So, I wanted to mention uh, that here as well. Linda says she tried ozepemec and it made her sick. Uh, it was not worth it for me. I've heard uh, that from other people. Uh, Herbert says, uh, fasting is the best solution. Yeah, I think fasting has a lot of benefits, of course. Um, Kaylin said, I am in a paid drug trial for semi-glutide for six months. I'm struggling with fatigue and constipation. It has been difficult to eat more than 1,000 calories per day. Um, so yeah, these uh, from what I've heard with clients that have used semi-glutide or ozepemic is it does have a powerful appetite suppressant effect. And so that is obviously great, but at the same time, if you're chronically under eating calories, then you're inducing this so-called adaptive thermogenesis that we just mentioned that can lead you to regain weight once you remove the drug. Now, it's hard to focus on exercise and prioritize um, movement and physical activity if you're only eating 1,000 calories per day, Caitlin. So I think that's the thing to remember is you know, uh, calorie restriction is helpful, but we also want to encourage exercise and make that a, a, a you know, part of our uh, lifestyle plan. So that's another thing to uh, consider uh, as well. So just want to hop on real quick and kind of share this information with you guys. I don't think too many people are talking about it, but there's ample evidence to suggest that, you know, these quick fixes aren't really sustainable fixes. They are maybe helping people under consume energy in the short term, but that leads to a weight regain. And then what happens, you know, when you desensitize these receptors? Okay, so Audrey says, is it beneficial to take 500 milligrams daily after supper, even on training days? Yeah, Audrey, the only time that you don't want to take berberine is just before exercise, because actually you want a little bit higher levels of glucose around exercise that helps you have better exercise performance. And so it is important to recognize that berberine has a powerful effect in improving blood sugar health and also imp increasing levels of ketones. And so it's going to help you in possibly in the post-exercise window, improve insulin sensitivity and, and blood glucose uh, homeostasis and metabolic health. So even on training days, taking it around supper, after dinner, in the evening is going to be just fine. Kristen says, I'd like to hear more about the adaptive thermogenesis. Yeah, so adaptive thermogenesis is a big multi-syllabic phrase that has to do with uh, the characterization of the human metabolism to adapt. And when people lose weight, now, you have healthy weight loss or unhealthy weight loss, you know, however you want to think about it, crash dieting and overexercise, when you lose weight, your resting metabolic rate goes down. I think there's a perception amongst overweight people that if they're overweight, they must have a sluggish metabolism. That has actually never been uh, fully vetted out in the literature. People that are, that are you know, 300 pounds have a much faster metabolic rate compared to people that are 200 pounds. Uh, but the problem is uh, in fuel partitioning and mitochondrial function, in which substrates are being oxidized for fuel. And so 
when you lose body weight, your metabolism slows down. And so the way to overcome this adaptive thermogenesis, we talked about this about a year ago with my friend Robert Sykes, is reverse dieting and calorie cycling and carbohydrate cycling. So going slow when it, when it comes to losing weight is going to be more favorable to prevent this adaptive thermogenic slowdown in your resting metabolic rate. Okay. All right, Rebecca says, can my body temperature increase with consistent increase of animal protein? Um, yeah, Rebecca, I wouldn't focus on your body temperature necessarily increasing. Um, you know, when we think about thermogenic aids and fat loss aids and things of the sort, um, you know, you do see changes in body temperature, but it, it's a better proxy to focus on strength and to focus on, uh, uh, you know, body fat percentage, intracellular water. So, um, Looking at your body temperature, you know, like I said, a 300 pound person is going to have a higher body temperature than a 100 pound person, right? So body temperature is not going to be a really good proxy of weight loss or body composition. So again, we want to focus on maintaining and preserving that muscle mass and slow and steady weight loss. So that's an interesting uh, question, but thank you for that. Okay, BDOG001 says, when is the best time to take berberine? Thank you. So the best time, in my opinion, most people struggle in the evening, consuming sugary uh, processed foods as treats, eating late and so forth. Again, we know that late night eating and snacking close to bedtime is linked with weight gain. That is inarguable, okay? So uh, berberine has an appetite suppressant effect, uh, but it does so naturally by improving the gut microbiome, naturally stimulating these gut hormones, um, and having impacts on mitochondrial function. So unlike in these injectable pharmacologic agents like semiglutide and, and ozepemic, berberine is functioning more naturally. It's been used for 3,000 years. I'll put links below to the berberine fasting accelerator. This can be a tool around d dinner time. So two to three capsules, you know, before dinner, during dinner, or after dinner, something to that effect can be helpful in uh, curbing those food cravings in the evening. Yeah, Kristen has a great question. She says, does alternate day fasting help prevent adaptive thermogenesis? Yeah, this is a good question. I, I believe that there that is a good strategy to prevent that because, again, it's the inconsistency, right, where some days you're like you're cycling your calories. So I do think that alternate day fasting is a, is a viable strategy to so-called prevent reverse, I'm sorry, adaptive thermogenesis, as is reverse dieting. So if you go into YouTube right now, type in reverse dieting Robert Sykes. He and I did a great podcast about the details about how to properly reverse diet um, and uh, kind of carbohydrate or, or calorie backload on different days. So I think that's a helpful tool. Angela says, I started my fasting about 45 days ago based on Mindy Peltz's Fast Like a Girl, and it has made a huge difference. Weight loss is slow, and I've been seeing many improvements. Um, thank goodness the shot's were expensive. So Angela, it sounds like fasting has been helpful for you. Thank you for sharing that information. And friends, if you're enjoying this this live session, hit that like button. That really goes a long way. Thanks for being here live with us. If you have any other questions, just please keep firing away. Okay. So um, Dennis, thank you for the super chat. That is helpful. Kristen says, I like your prayer brain 500, 500, 500 milligrams, uh, three times a day, too much. She says, um, okay. You know, people have been taking various levels of berberine up to 3000 milligrams a day. I think, you know, a bolus dose of 500 to 750 milligrams is more than sufficient. So those are, those are what I found with people. The, the downside is when you get into the higher dosages of berberine, uh, it can cause about 5% of people have an upset tummy and that. So Kristen, uh, really, um, you know, starting out at 500 milligrams a couple times a day, I think that's totally fine. Um, I definitely agree uh, with what you're saying. Okay, does alternate day fasting, intermittent fasting window improve mold detox? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how fasting would necessarily improve mold detox. The, the best way to get rid of mold is to change your living situation. Get air filters, uh, have get rid of the source of the mold, uh, improve quality of fresh air and things like that. So that's going to be the best way um, to get rid of mold detox. Uh, fasting is not necessarily going to increase the levels of detoxification enzymes. Um, so... Uh, specifically referring to mold. So that's a that's a good question, though. 
Okay, Caitlin says, do you have any ideas for people that are coming off semi-glutide? Yeah, I would just maintain your exercise. Make sure that you're exercising regularly, uh, specifically resistance training and doing some form of uh, cardio on top of that. You can try berberine fasting accelerator, um, do various things along those lines to make sure that you're... Um, and make sure that you're chewing your food mindfully. I think one of the big reasons why people actually have a desensitization to these incretin hormones is they're not chewing their food mindfully. They're not making time for meals. I know this sounds like a little woo-woo and sort of like a new age and so forth, but you know the gut uh, and digestion and post-meal absorption and, and post-meal metabolism is, is mediated by a parasympathetic state. And if people are on their cell phones, they're eating their food while they're driving their car, or they're stressed out in front of the television, that's not going to facilitate healthy post-meal absorption of these various foods. So um, I think that's, that's important to recognize is take time uh, for your meals. Uh, Jim says, is taking semaglutide with berberine okay? Um, you know, Possibly, yeah. Uh, but like I said, I, I you know the, I, I think that just semi-glutide. I'm all I'm all about better life through chemistry. And if if people get benefits from semi-glutide or things like that, okay, fine, like no problem. Um, but it, of course, I, you know the data clearly shows that when people come off it, they gain weight. You know they regain most of the weight that they lost. And so I don't think there's any free ride here. So I think it's better to sustainably find a solution that works for you over the long haul. Um, and if you have a, a propensity to overconsume energy or calories, you know you might want to consider other more natural options like going for a walk after you eat, mindfully eating, chewing your food, uh, and maybe trying natural products like berberine and things like that. Uh, again, I have no problem with people trying uh, all sorts of different pharmacologic agents, but um, you know it, it does seem that uh, people are gaining weight uh, after they come off semi-glutide. Okay. So friends, let me know, was this helpful? Let me know in the chat by hitting that like button. Uh, do you like these live sessions? This was very impromptu. I was just um, doing some research on semi-glutide and, and uh, some of the uh, studies, and I was surprised to find that 66% of the people that lost weight, uh, they, they regained it after the fact. So Shannon says, can you please provide resources for someone trying to lose weight the healthy way? Shannon, we have over a thousand videos on this channel. Um, if you use the desktop future, type in any keyword you want, muscle, weight loss, belly fat. We've been making videos, three to four videos per week for the past, gosh, almost 10 years now, eight years. So uh, tons of videos, Shannon, that can lead you down the right path, um, including fasting videos and, and much more. Uh, Orbit20 says, wait, so intermittent fasting doesn't allow your body to detox mycotoxins? Um Intermittent fasting is not necessarily a, a detoxification amplifier. Uh, intermittent fasting, um, it, there's a lot of benefits to fasting, right? From improving glycemic variability to uh, improving circadian rhythm function, but it doesn't necessarily inherently enhance the detoxification of mold. Um, if you're specifically focused on mold detoxification and you feel like you're exposed to mold, uh, you might want to consider cholestyramine or bile acid sequestrants, things, and making sure you go into the bathroom regularly on time. Uh, there's nothing specifically inherently magic about fasting and detoxification. Um, if you want to enhance detoxification, you might want to consider an acetylcysteine and glycine combinations. They've been shown to support glutathione by biosynthesis. But fasting is not necessarily a modality that specifically enhances detoxification. Uh, it's specifically a, you know, an alternative to calorie restriction. You know, some people don't want to continuously restrict their energy, so they choose to compress their feeding window as opposed to restricting their energy continuously. Okay, Rebecca says, uh, oh, thank you, Rebecca. Janet says, and us are overwhelmed and overweight people are tired of all your tricks. Huh. Um, Janet has a lot of negative comments. What tricks are we talking about, uh, Janet? Um, I, I haven't mentioned any tricks here. I'm just talking about sustainable solutions that actually lead to long-term effects uh, without regaining the weight that you lost. And, and if you've been listening this whole time, uh, you know, just to clarify, um, we're, we're just talking about, you know, <laughs> 
exercising consistently, compressing your feeding windows consistently, not eating in the four hours before bedtime, making time for your meals, chewing your food mindfully. I don't, I don't know how that's a trick. These are just habits that actually are sustainable as opposed to uh, pharmacologic agents that have quick fixes, but actually don't lead to long-term uh, fat loss. Okay. Jim says, some of my concerns are, are taking semi-glutide long-term. Yeah, of course, Jim. Uh, there is actually research um, that shows that semi-glutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists actually might increase risk of pancreatic cancer, which is a cancer you definitely don't want. Um, so Jim has said, I yo-yo up and down and over the past several years um, have uh, could lose weight. Yeah, so... I do think it's important to be consistent, Jim. There, there are, you know, uh, instead of yo-yo dieting, being very consistent every day with your feeding fasting window, not eating before bed, resistance training at least four days per week, walking after major meals, uh, baking in some cardio, some HIIT training, uh, and and making sure you're not over-consuming energy, not having processed packaged foods or alcohol. Uh, I mean, most people do quite well on that way uh, of living. And so it becomes a lifestyle, not just a weight loss strategy. Okay. All right. Uh, Busty says, mm, hairy rooster. Yeah, my hair is long. I don't know if I'm a rooster, but my hair is long. Um, so friends, was this helpful? Let me know in the comments. Let me know by hitting that like button. Of course, I'm grateful that you are all here right now. Um, have a great evening. And I just wanted to make you aware of this research. Uh, should some of you want to consider this and recognize that uh, there is no no quick fix here. Um, this is a lifestyle. And so that's uh, really, really important. Okay. Anna has a good comment. She says, she was on ozepemic dose of 0.5 milligrams and realized what you were saying is true. It has helped me lose weight, but I had to do the work myself without an ozepemic shot. I wish, I'm going to pin, can I pin this? I'm going to pin this comment uh, because this is a this is an amazing uh, message. I'm going to pin that. Okay. Um, so that is, that is pinned. I just want people to recognize that you have to do the work. And I'm trying to give you ideas of where to start. Not eating before bed within a three hour window before bed, being consistent with your sleep wake cycles, getting sunlight, exercising intensely, stimulating your muscles, prioritizing protein, uh, chewing your food mindfully. I mean, th these are simple things actually. Not eating processed foods, cooking your food from scratch. Um, so thanks as always for tuning in friends. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for sharing this video if you found it helpful and we'll catch you in a future episode down the road. Have a good, good day. Bye now.